This is 50 Feminist States, a road tripping storytelling podcast visiting all 50 U.S. states to interview feminist activists and artists about their work for gender justice. I'm Amelia Freeby, and this week we're in Tennessee. From the glaciers of Alaska to the dunes of Indiana, I want 50 feminist states. From the waves of New Hampshire to the skies of Montana, I want 50 feminist states. And when you hear the cold, you know so well, sisters speak out. Hi everyone, Amelia here. Welcome back to season three of the 50 Feminist States podcast. This week we're in Mississippi and I am talking to Jamie Harker, the founder of Violet Valley Bookstore, also a professor, old miss, also all around community member and queer icon. Before we get to that interview, I would love to take a moment to encourage you to rate and review the podcast on iTunes. This season, we are running a season long giveaway. Anyone who rates and reviews the podcast on iTunes during season three will automatically be entered to win a super cool 50 Feminist States swag pack. That'll include a 50 Feminist States tote bag, a fanny pack, a bunch of stickers, some buttons, notepads, pens, basically all of the cool 50 Feminist States merch that I have after all of the Kickstarter campaigns that many of you have so helpfully funded. Shout out to you. Thanks so much. So again, you can just rate and review the podcast on iTunes to be automatically entered to win. We will announce a winner at the end of the season. So as I mentioned, coming up this week, I have an extra special conversation with Jamie Harker of Violet Valley Bookstore. There is a very long tradition of feminist bookstores in the United States. And I have to admit, as a book lover and an ardent feminist, they're really close to my heart. Chicago has an amazing one called Women and Children First. There are others all around the country. On the season three road trip, I visited Violet Valley in Mississippi and Kara's Bookstore or in Decatur, Georgia. And they're always just such a joy, such wonderful spaces to be in. So I would encourage you as you're listening, go ahead and look up and see if there's a feminist bookstore in your community or somewhere nearby. Maybe you can give it a visit. Maybe you can start buying your books through there, or maybe you'll find that there's even an opportunity for you to create one. We'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of the episode. For now, I'm happy to introduce Jamie Harker. She is a professor of English and the director of the Sarah Isom Center for Women and Gender Studies at the University of Mississippi. She helps organize the Oxford, Mississippi Queer Pride Week and Parade. She recently put out a book called The Lesbian South, Southern Feminist, The Women in Print Movement, and the Queer Literary Canon. And in addition to that, she founded Violet Valley Bookstore, a nonprofit queer feminist bookstore in Water Valley, Mississippi, a town of about 4,000 people. I was so excited to go there. It was maybe one of my favorite places that I went on the season three road trip. And you can go see images of it on our Instagram at 50 Feminist States and on the Violet Valley Instagram at Violet Valley Books. If you want a little inside peek while we're talking about it on the podcast for this week, I'm going to go ahead and share our conversation as it happened when I was at that wonderful bookstore. So we'll start with Jamie telling you a little bit about herself and how Violet Valley Books was founded. Here's Jamie now. So I uh, am Jamie Harker. I'm a professor of English at the University of Mississippi, and I'm the director of the Sarah Isom Center for Women and Gender Studies. On the weekend, I'm here at Violet Valley Bookstore. This is a queer feminist nonprofit bookstore. It's in a little town of about 4,000. We're 17 miles from Oxford, Mississippi, where I work. We have been open. It will be two years in December. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey to starting the bookstore? You know, I always joke that anyone who loves books has always dreamed of having a bookstore. There's anyone who isn't a book kid who was like, wouldn't it be great to have a bookstore? Um, but I think more directly, the motivation for me was I had been working on this book about Southern lesbian feminists that just came out last fall. Um, and all of them were involved in the women in print movement, which is this really cool, you know, feminist movement where they were starting their own presses and their own distribution system and their own bookstores. And they had this whole idea that like from the idea in the writer's brains, the reader holding the book, they wanted it to be women owned, women controlled so that they wouldn't be controlled by the mainstream media, as I think they called them. I'm trying to think of what it, lice, <laughs> the literary industrial <laughs> corporate establishment, which really cracks me up. There's a really good book about this called The Feminist Bookstore Movement by Kristen Hogan as well. Um, and so it's this amazing moment. So all these writers were involved in it in a lot of ways. Dorothy Allison used to run a women's center. You had people like Minnie Bruce Pratt and Mab Segrist running um, their own feminist periodical. 
uh, called Feminary. June Arnold, who was a lesbian feminist writer, founded Daughters, Inc., which is the one that published Rita Mae Brown's Ruby Fruit Jungle in their first run. They were all over the place, not only writing, but creating their own systems. And they did this when it wasn't easy to do. You know, I mean, they didn't have email. They couldn't crowdsource. You know, how do you get they had to literally save up to get long distance calls because it was expensive. A lot of them would get jobs where they could get free long distance. They would write each other letters. They would throw books in a bag and drive across the country and couch surf and drop them off at bookstores. They had to get like movable tight presses and teach themselves how to use it and use mimeograph machines. I mean, they were just remarkable. They set up this amazing system. And a lot of the stuff we read today came out of those presses first. And as I was working on the book, I thought, man, they did this with nothing. You know, they did it with like a dream and moxie and like borrowing 2000 bucks from their parents to open a bookstore. And, you know, and I'm like, I, I have way more advantages than they had when they started. I could do something small like this. So. I really thought it was a cool idea. And when this space came open, it felt kind of perfect. It, just to give you a visual uh, for those who are listening on podcasts, it is 10 feet wide and 40 feet deep. It was originally quite literally the alley between two buildings. So you can kind of see if you look up the bricks that it was just an alleyway. And then at a certain point around, I think the 1890s, turn of the century, they covered the alley up and just put a roof on it. Um, the first thing it was, was a cigar store and a bookstore, which I love. People told me that when I opened it and I was joking, we need to get like a humidor and, you know, like add it all together. Uh, when I first m came down here and moved here, it was still a barbershop, which it had been for decades. It was like a two chair, three chair barbershop. I've still got the pig sink in the back, you know, it's behind the counter. Um, and I still have men come in and telling me they got their haircut here every two weeks, you know, growing up. And then that closed down. And then there were two artists in town who opened it as Yellow Studio or Yellow Gallery. And it was a really cool little studio space as you might imagine because it was just like little and intimate um, and then one of them started doing quilts and she quite literally didn't have enough room to lay it out because it's only 10 feet wide <laughs> so she took a building on the next block and then it was vacant and I remember saying to my wife who owns the building next door that would be the coolest space for a bookstore I just really like the shape of it and it was sort of daydreaming like I really was sort of talking and Dixie said you should totally do that that would be awesome why not do it? I'm like, I can't do it. I don't have time. I don't know anything. I've never even worked in a bookstore. And she says, you could do it. We should do it. And so I thought, well, I'll ask her. And she's like, that's a great idea. It's, it's open in November. This was like six months before. And then I had a panic attack. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait, that was just weird as talking. What just happened, right? But a lot of things made it possible. One is that it's really affordable rents, right? Not only, I mean, in general, Water Valley is much more affordable than Oxford, which is why a lot of artists and professors have moved down here. Uh, but even for Water Valley, it's very affordable because it's a weird little space. It's not like you can do a lot with it, right? So that really helped. There was a annual book sale that the American Association of University Women used to do in Oxford every year. And they had decided to stop doing it because it just wasn't getting them enough return and they had to store all the books. And I knew one of the women who ran it and I said, hey, what are you doing with all your leftover books? And she said, oh my God, will you take them off my hands? We don't want to pay for them. So they gave me 2,000 volumes of books. And that really helped us get started because the hardest thing about a bookstore besides, you know, the month to month stuff is is stocking it, right? The back stock is a lot of money. So that gave me enough to kind of get started. And then there was a, a woman who was a, a AmeriCorps volunteer I knew who had worked at Square Books and heard about the bookstore kind of bubbling up and was like, oh, I want to help with that. And so I said, well, maybe we could do like a Kickstarter campaign. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And Ellis knew how to do all this. So took a video of us and they posted it and we set a fairly modest goal. And we're like, yeah, we'll just we'll just post it and we'll wait and see. Um, and it took off because a lot of Mississippians shared it. So I, I, I had friends and former students and they shared it and it was public. And so we met our goal in four days. I was like, we should have asked for more money. That's awesome, right? So we had some money to buy some new books. And so we we really, we set it up as a nonprofit so that people could make donations of books or money if they wanted to, to help out. Now with the changes in the tax law, it's not quite as attractive because there's a, there's a barrier now that's high enough. It doesn't matter. But I have found that people who are moving or downsizing are just thrilled to bring me books. So I've not had a problem having books people will donate them and that keeps it fresh and i have people that's the other thing people mail me books to help the store so i still will get little notices and they'll have mailed a box of books i got one from like a boston gay and lesbian community center i get them from individual people it's really cool and they send me really good stuff so i've got a outside of Karis bookstore which of course in atlanta is like the jewel of feminist bookstores in the south i've got a pretty good gay and lesbian <laughs> literature collection because of people bringing me stuff 
Um, so that, that's sort of how the journey has gone. And it's been, you know, it's been fun to see how much people like the idea. I get, still get people driving up from Jackson or down from Memphis or from a little town. And they're so excited. They've never seen a gay and lesbian bookstore or a feminist bookstore. They've only seen it on Portlandia, right? Like they think it's like something imaginary. So it's right here. And there are all these books that they can just browse and look at. And there's, you know, rainbow flags. There's three in the bookstore, including one in the window. Um, and it's not something they expect to see, especially in a little town in Mississippi. It like brought me joy, just like driving out and seeing, just seeing the front of it is so, so thrilling. So you've talked about how you started the bookstore, some of the people that have supported stocking it and getting it started. Since it's been open, what has the community been like that's kind of come up in through around the store? Well, you know, what's been lovely to see is that you see a lot of different people, allies and folks who identify as LGBTQ, but also people who just love books are starting to come here. So um, you, there's obviously a lot of students and faculty from Oxford help with donations and also with coming to support the store. But we have built a kind of local community as well. Um, folks who identify as LGBTQ, folks who just think it's good to have a range of books available. Um, because we're a nonprofit, I make classics and children's books especially very affordable. So you can buy a book here for a dollar. Um, and you can get children's books. Usually I try to price them so you can own them and take them home. So there are folks who just bring their kids periodically and come in and stock up. There's a, you may have noticed, I'll show you in a minute, there are a bunch of aardvarks around the room, little stuffed animal aardvarks. And there's a story behind that, as you might imagine. Uh, there's a guy I knew from the university and he said, hey, I used to own this bookstore in Meridian, which is about five, six hours south. And when the bookstore closed, he just took all the stock, stuck it in a house and they moved to Oxford and just left it for 10 years. And they were about to move away. And he said, do you want the books? And of course, I'm like, yeah, I want the books. So he brings me again about 2000 volumes of books. And an entire garbage bag filled with aardvarks because it was called the aardvark. <laughs> and I just thought it was delightful. So I put them all around the store. And whenever people would ask me, I would say, didn't you know that the aardvark is a secret gay symbol? I'm just messing with them. You know, it's fun. <laughs> it's not really. Now it sort of has become one. But I was just laughing. Like, you didn't know that? Really? And so now they just joke around about it. So if anyone ever asks me about an aardvark, I say, if you buy a book, I'll give you a free aardvark. And the kids love it. So this woman in town who's got a couple of kids came in and said, my kids have announced that they want to start a reading club and they're calling it the Aardvark Club. So they all have Aardvarks and they're going to start a little reading book club. So anyway, it's just delightful. So like it's that kind of stuff that emerges that's really kind of charming. Um, there, There's a guy in town who comes in and if you saw him, he's wearing camo and He's got tattoos. He looks like kind of some, uh, you know, somebody you wouldn't expect to like a bookstore like this. He loves reading. And he's like, wow, they got really good books there and they're really affordable. So he comes in and browses my mystery section all the time, you know, and that's the kind of thing that I think is kind of charming is that you get people driving in, but also people from around town who just like having a bookstore in town and they like having the range of stuff here. What is Water Valley like? Obviously, the bookstore has become like this part of the community, but I'd love to hear more about the 4,000 people that live here that I'm sure you know many of, and maybe also a little bit like how you landed here. Um, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a transitioning community. So there's been some tension, as you might imagine. There are folks who have been here for generations, like their, their, their people came here at the turn of the century. It was originally a railroad town. So it was a hub town. And there's still a little railroad museum that has a sign that sort of says how many miles it is from New Orleans, how many miles it is from Chicago, right? It was on the line that goes north. And that was the main business here for a long time. If you're a Faulkner fan, um, Mottsville is based on Water Valley. So at the end of The Sand and the Fury, when Jason is trying to catch his niece who's hopped on the train, he drives to Mottsville, which is Water Valley. At the end of Light in August, that's where they find Joe Christmas, right, is, is here in Mottsville. Um, in the 50s, when the railroads largely shut down, the town went into kind of an economic decline. And it, so there's a lot of people who've been here who kind of kept Main Street going. Turnage Drugstore has been here since the turn of the, turn of the 19th century, you know, the 20th century, right? About 1900. Um, but you had a lot of empty storefronts. You had some that were kind of falling in. And it was it was not um, thriving a lot. They, there's a Borg Warner plant, which is the main way that folks in town that come through here. Um, but what started to happen is actually I had a colleague in that Trevzer in the English department with me and she and her husband bought a house down here and they bought a storefront down here. And I first came to Water Valley coming to see them. And I was like, Ooh, I really like this little town. I love older houses. Oxford, even when I moved here in 2003 was too expensive for an assistant professor to own a house. It had already started to become a, a destination spot for retirees and, 
it was getting pricier and then the older houses forget about it you know they just were way beyond my my means but i thought ooh i could afford it here um so i kind of looked around and found a place and it started off just as like it was close enough it was sort of an overflow from oxford um it has grown a lot more. It's starting to get, um, the prices are starting to go up on real estate. That they're still a lot cheaper than Oxford. But there's been some tension between the folks who are from here and, and the people they see as outsiders, right? Um, even from Oxford, because my wife, Dixie Grimes, grew up in Oxford, but that's, you know, that's still not Water Valley, right? So I think that it is working out and there's some, there, it's managing, but there there can be some flare-ups, in town, but you get a lot of people who are artists or who just want to try something or are, you know, interested in music and other spaces and having a little bit more kind of flexibility so they don't have to make a gazillion dollars to do it. Um, so my friend Annette opened Beaux Arts Gallery, um, which is kind of based on that famous Mencken dismissal, right? Like the Beaux, you know, Beaux Arts sort of B O Z A R T S and playing with the French. Um, and that was the kind of the first anchor. And then at one point we had like three art galleries in town, which was kind of fun. And then the BTC old fashioned grocery was opened by Alexi Van Buren as a grocery store. Initially, um, she and her husband had bought the building next door. There actually used to be a used bookstore called Kafka's. The former owner comes in here all the time. They're really cool. Um, and they were going to, it was bought by a developer in Oxford. who was going to tear down the building for the bricks. And when they found out about it, they're like, we don't want that to happen. So they get, persuaded him to sell it to them. And then her husband was fixing it up on the weekend. And she opened this um, this really cool local uh, grocery store that uses like Brown's Dairy, which is just up the road and all kind of local produce. And then they opened a restaurant at one point. And Dixie Grimes, who had been in Oxford and been a fine dining chef on the square, had moved back from Houston and didn't want to kind of jump right into the fray during football season, which is crazy up there. So she said, oh, I'll work here for a little while. And um, it turned out to be a really good mix. She says that Water Valley reminds her of Oxford when she was growing up in the 70s. It was a much more of a sleepy town. Um, and she really liked having control over what she could cook and the creativity. So she's now a, an owner. So they're, they're business partners next door. So it's it's a place where you can do kind of cool stuff and try things out and not have it bankrupt you. You know, I mean, you, I could never do this. Forget New York or Chicago. I could never I could never even afford it in Oxford. I wouldn't have the, the capital. I wouldn't have the time. But here you can pay. You know, if I had to, I could cover this right. The rent, you know, so it lets you take a chance on a thing that you couldn't do otherwise. And I, and I really like that about this town. There's a lot of interest and you're getting interesting coalitions building with folks who are from here and folks who have moved here. And, and there are kind of alliances you wouldn't necessarily expect that I think make it work. That's so cool. I'm glad to hear that the tension is at least for now, like turning it coalitional. I think that's a good way for tension to go. I love hearing how much the community has embraced you. I'm wondering if you've faced any sorts of like people who are really homophobic or transphobic or if there's been any sort of like backlash from more conservative folks in Mississippi or I'm very open to being told like that's not the experience here and that's like an outsider perspective so I'm just wondering what that's like yeah it's there was a lot more kind of freak out backlash when they first heard about the bookstore um you know the good news about the kickstarter campaign is that it was shared widely and, and people supported us but the bad news was also that it was shared widely so it became uh there was a lot of crazy rumors circulating on social media when they heard about the bookstore most people hadn't even bothered watching the video which i talked about what our vision was and we'd have books for everything and a specialty so there were all kinds of rumors um that we were being funded by the Democratic Party was one, and I've never gotten a check, by the way, um, that we were going to sell porn, that we were going to have workshops to teach kids how to be transgendered. And I said, that's not how it works. You don't know. They don't know that. Um, my favorite rumor was there was a gang of lesbians from a neighboring town invading Water Valley and corrupting it. And I said, I've been looking for a gang of lesbians my whole life. Where are they? Come on in, right? Um they had a series of prayer meetings in the park across the street three Thursdays in a row. Um, and that was a little less funny. It was a little worrying. Um, and they got increasingly hostile as they went on. So we didn't go to them. The second one, my wife watched the video of, cause she wanted to see what was happening. 
And there was a Baptist church from out in the county that bussed people in for the prayer meeting. And there was a guy at the mic, and at a certain point he screamed, we don't need books, in this really disgusted way. And when Dixie saw that, she said, okay, I think we need a security system. So we did get a security system installed at the bookstore and at home. And we still have that. We have a little camera up there. So we keep that on. And that was, that was a, because we got a little worried about it, about some of the, the weird, crazy talk going on. Um, and Dixie kept saying, we just need to open and let them see because all the stuff that they're afraid of is not true. And once they see that it's open, it's going to get better. And she was right. Um, when we opened, you know, there were people in town who were like, we will never set foot in there. And I said, okay, I mean, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. Um, and they kind of saw it was a bookstore, which they kept writing about a bookstore in quotations, like it was some kind of sham. I said, no, it's really a bookstore. I'm a literature professor. Like this is, I study this stuff. This is what we do. So once we got out here, I think um, it made people kind of go, okay, maybe that wasn't it. There was still, there's a small core of people who don't like the bookstore, would never come in the bookstore, think it's a terrible thing to have the bookstore. Um, And that's their prerogative. They get to feel that way. But generally speaking, that's really calmed down. And I've never had any incident at the bookstore. It's never been vandalized. I've never had anyone come in and, and be hostile or try to smash things up or even just say anything ugly. They just generally don't come in if they don't like the bookstore. And that's fine. You know, um, and that's, I think, the thing that surprises people the most is that they really thought there would be a lot of incidents and, you know, knock on wood, like I don't want to I don't want to jinx it. But so far, no one's written anything outside. No one's really done anything. They just either come in or they don't. And the longer we just keep showing up. So we're here every week. I'm, you know, if it's quiet, and no one's inside. I read outside and I talk to people. Um, we always, my uh, wife has taken over decorating the window. So you can kind of see the end of, with the watermelons, we had the window painted for the watermelon carnival, which is the big carnival in town that a lot of Southern towns will have little Southern like summer events. Um, and we left a few of them up because she decorates for every holiday and there's always a lot of stuff in the window. We always have an inflatable, like little animal outside. I've got a flamingo right now and the kids love them, you know? And so that's always outside. So it's, it's like a fun, festive place and people like it. You know, we're always posting pictures on Instagram or Facebook of people coming to see us or people will bring me cupcakes and we'll give them out. And, you know, it's that kind of place. Like people just like it. Um, and it's a happy place. So we're always buying ads in the local newspaper to support stuff whenever they ask us. So there's always a little Violet Valley bookstore and the football page. And we were in the Watermelon Carnival program and um, we just keep showing up. And what I like about the bookstore for me is that you know, we have forced, I think, a conversation in the town in which we live to say, look, you know, we've always been here, right? I know the way things worked was nobody talked about it. And you would all kind of just talk about it in code and move on. But we're here. And we're not going to just slink away anymore. And you have to reckon with us. And if you want us in town, you have to take all of us. You don't get to just pick and choose the parts of us and pretend the other stuff doesn't exist. That's how you want a bookstore in town. You can have a bookstore, but you got to walk past my rainbow flag because that's why I'm doing it. And if you don't want to walk past the rainbow flag, then you don't get to have the rest of the bookstore. Um, and I think that has been the thing I've been most pleased about is because people really had to reckon with it. And so you had interesting conversations happening in churches. Like I would hear this from people that there was a, a guy in town and they were all talking about how terrible the bookstore was and how the bookstore shouldn't be allowed to be here. And this guy said, well, shouldn't we love them the way Jesus taught us to? And they would get really mad, but they had these conversations or they had a whole conversation. Should you go in the bookstore? And there was a, a preacher who said, you know, why do you think that you're better than they are? If you think everyone's sinning, then why, why do you think you can't go in? And these are not necessarily at a level I'd always want the conversations to have, but they have to have it. They can't pretend this is someone from somewhere else. So they really want to, I've, I've lived here since 2008. I walk my dogs in town every day, right? We are all part of this community. We support things in this community. We show up, some of us own businesses, we pay taxes. We're here. And there are people who like the fact that the bookstore is here. And I bring people in sometimes. That's the other thing that's really funny. For the first time we had an event, Oxford has had a pride parade every year 
it'll be our fifth this coming year. And we added a little morning event if they wanted to come down and have breakfast. And we were giving little discounts if you came in pride colors. So we had the entire Main Street covered up with people in rainbow gear. And it was really pretty charming, you know, because it's like on the one hand, you don't see that all the time in Water Valley. On the other hand, they were buying stuff everywhere in this town. They were going down to turnage. They were buying coffee at the coffee shop. You were seeing this kind of movement that was happening. When we had a conference at the university, a, a Southeastern Women's Studies conference, there was a group of students from East Tennessee, and they brought their East Tennessee bus down here and parked in front of the bookstore and unloaded like 20 students who came in, which I thought was awesome, right? Like we are bringing in people. And I think that complicates the conversation too. I mean, the realtors love it. Like, you know, I, I will sometimes get queries from people and I'll send them their way and they're like, yeah, bring them in. We'd love to sell to them. And that makes a difference too. Yeah. I mean, I love that story, the way that like a queer feminist bookstore can change the economic landscape of a small town like this in the South. Uh, this is a totally different kind of question. And if it's a personal question, you don't have to answer it. But you keep talking about Dixie. And I would love to know how you met and and just a little bit about your love story. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. Um we smile about this because I've known Dixie since I moved here. Um, and when I moved here, I was uh, in a relationship with one of her longtime friends in town. And she was in a long-term relationship with, with somebody. So I just knew her as a friend here for a long time. And then when she had come back uh, to Mississippi, she moved here. And so we were living in the same town when she came down here and was working on it. So she's just someone I've known for a long time. And we've been really close friends and tried to help each other out. Uh, and then when that rela when my relationship ended after 11 years, um, we spent time together because she was, you know, I was not doing well, right? I wasn't really, you know, happy about where things were going. Um, and so we spent a lot of time there and she was single. And so what was great is when we um, got together, we already knew each other, right? So there was none of that like awkward, you know, I'm trying to pretend to be someone I'm not. There were no secrets. I mean, she knew every fly I had. Right? And it was all very central. So it was like you had this basis of really great friendship and trust. Um, and then when we became a couple, we were like, oh, wow, how do we not know this? Like, this is great. Like, it, it was a little scary at first because you think, I don't want to ruin the friendship if something goes wrong. But what was terrific about it was you had that foundation. And then when you, when you add the romance, we were like, well, this is like perfect, right? It's amazing. So, you know, it's really wonderful to have someone who, um, just supports what you want to do. It makes you think you can do anything. You know, I don't think I would have had the courage to open this bookstore if she hadn't said, you can totally do this. I will help you. Because I'm like, I am, I'm a professor, right? English. I don't know anything about money. Can I do books? You know, and she said, I will help you do all that. And she has, right? So it makes me try things I probably wouldn't have before. And I really, I, I'm really grateful for that every day that I'm able to say like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I've always wanted to do this. I probably wouldn't have had the courage if I hadn't had someone who said, you can do it. I think that's amazing, right? That is really amazing. And I think it's also just in the spirit of any feminist or LGBTQ bookstore, like it takes more than one person to bring it to life. So I'm really big on being proud of our own successes, but recognizing everyone else who makes them possible, because I think the sorts of like individualist narratives we have around, you know, one person doing all the things are, are destructive. So it's exciting to hear. And thank you for sharing. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think not only the partners, obviously, who are essential, but all the other people, I don't think this would have taken off if people hadn't gotten so excited about it and shared ideas and wanted to help and you know i have students who are like can i come volunteer can i come help you sort let me do something let me help bring things um you really have to have that community support and the other side of this is too when it's the individual like you know sort of exceptional person narrative it makes people think they can't do it too and the truth is, I mean, stuff happens because people decide they want it to happen and they make it happen. So, you know, when I was going around giving some talks for my book last year, I would often have people say, we just are really frustrated. We do not like the queer spaces that are available in our city. And I said, well, why don't you start something new? And th it had never occurred to them. You know, they wanted to say what was wrong with what was there. And I said, you know what, if we waited for someone else to do it, we wouldn't have any of the things we had. That's why I love those early feminists. They were so fearless. They said, we... When you look at the atmosphere they were in and what they created in that hostile space, they're like, we don't care. We're making what we need, right? We're going to remake the world the way we think it should be. And we're not going to wait for someone to give us permission or approval. Um, and you can do that too. I mean, it's not exceptional. If you don't have a feminist bookstore in your community, start one. Get people to help you. 
Get someone to give you a room in their building if they don't, if you don't have the money to pay the larger rent. Get people to, to come and support you and you're going to find there's a lot of power in that. If I can have one in little teeny tiny Water Valley, Mississippi, there's no reason you can't have one where you are. I keep it going. I think that would be amazing. So I love that sort of empowering message. And I take inspiration too from like, early feminists, whether it be like first wave folks or just like the sixties activist who just did the work. And a lot of people I've talked to in particularly in smaller places. One of the women I interviewed said this great thing about how like when you're in kind of an under resourced area, you have to be like a generalist feminist. You have to know a little bit about everything and you have to be doing the work in all the areas. And nobody's an expert, so nobody has to be and you just like roll up your sleeves and get it done and that's definitely an ethos that I see among all of like the grassroots people I've been talking to, which is cool. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That kind of do-it-yourself approach to it. One of the things I like about doing activist work and kind of collaborative work here is that you can't be a purist about who's allowed to be part of that movement. There's just not enough of you. You have to build alliances. You have to work with others. Um, you know, we would never have a pride parade in Oxford if it weren't for the allies, because about over half of the people who march don't identify as LGBTQ, but they identify as allies and they want to be part of it. And when you invite them to come, they're so excited. So you have like Oxford Film Festival, Yakima Tafa Arts Council, Mar you know, you've got all these other people who just think it's great to be part of it. And that collective energy is what makes it work. Um, and I think that's true in larger places, too. It's just easier to imagine that you can just talk to people who believe like you and look like you and have the exact same perspective. Here, you have to figure out how to build all that stuff in. Of course, we're trans inclusive. Of course, we're also interested in social justice, in racial issues and other places. Of course, we're part of that. That has to be part of that conversation. Um, and I like that about it, right? That you don't get as wrapped up in what sometimes feel like really destructive um, purity wars about who's in which space, right? You have to figure out how to work together. Um, and I think that's right. Like that, that's part of it. Um, I think that's all of my questions. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about your work, about the bookstore, about LGBTQ work or feminist things in this part of the world country? I guess all I would say is that um, what I love seeing is the LGBTQ community, I think, in Mississippi is starting to feel empowered. I think after HB 1523 passed, which is one of these religious freedom uh, license to discriminate bills that are out people got kind of fed up, you know, that, you know, we have been in this space and we have followed all these rules and you continue to use this as a punching bag. Um, and, you know, when we had our pride parade, it was right after that passed. That wasn't why we had already been planning it, but it made a lot of people want to come. And you're starting to see pride parades pop up in other communities across Mississippi. You're starting to see people who are creating spaces. Um, and I'm really proud of, of what I see my students doing and coming in with this kind of fearless can-do attitude. Um, and I would love to see folks come down and support them. And I don't just mean financially. I mean, come to these events, right? Recognize the bravery of people who are doing activism down here. It can be really easy to write off the whole region. But the truth is there are some really amazing people in the South who are basically held hostage by hostile state governments and, and not given the support they need. And the more we can see ourselves as part of a larger struggle and a part of a larger movement, I think the better. So I would love to see folks, if you're around this place, you know, do a tour if you want of all the queer friendly spaces and only give money there, but you can do it now, right? Come to these bookstores, come to these restaurants, go visit the activist spaces and think about the ways that it connects because this really is um, a moment that I think we all need to learn from each other and try to build each other up. You know, after the election, I read an article by somebody who said, the truth is we all live in Mississippi now. And we now have some things to teach you about how you resist a hostile place that's working actively against you. And, you know, this, we, I think my students often didn't know this could happen. Everything seemed like it was on this progress narrative getting better. And in many ways it is, but you're always going to have these backlashes and you've got to figure out how to weather them. And one of the ways are spaces, creating inclusive spaces where people can imagine possibilities and go off and do something amazing. I know that people who come in here will go off and do some stuff that I would never have dreamed of. And that's how it's supposed to work. And then someone will be inspired by them and try something even bigger.
Thanks so much to Jamie for taking the time to speak with me for the 50 Feminist Dates podcast. If you are as excited about Violet Valley books as I am, go ahead and give them a follow on Instagram. You can donate any super cool used queer and feminist books that you have to them. That information you'll find on their website, violetvalley.org. I also just want to give a shout out to Hooper and Sarah, who are two of Jamie's students at Old Miss, who I got to meet with while I was in Oxford. I really loved our conversation about the queer and feminist a scene there. And they just had such glowing things to say about Jamie and the role that she plays in the LGBTQ community in Oxford. So it's always so exciting to me to, you know, interview people for an episode. But when I get a chance to talk to other people in their community, and we all get to share kind of in the joy of the work that they're doing, that truly is the highlight of these seasons. So thanks so much to Jamie, Hopper, and Sarah for showing me a little bit of Oxford and Water Valley. It was a true joy. Got another episode coming out this week from Oklahoma. Can't wait to share that one with you. Until then, I'll see you on the road. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of 50 Feminist States. You can find show notes at 50feministstates.com slash podcast and follow us on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. Special thanks to Danielle Sines and Jessica Naria for our theme song. Until next time, wild ones, we'll see you on the road.